Um, thank you, Torrin. I'm going to start reading today from Matthew's Gospel in chapter 14. And uh, I had my gla- oh here there. I had my glasses here somewhere. Um, this is uh, well, it, it'll be evident what it is. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14, and verse 1 says, uh, At that time Herod the Tetrarch heard of the fame of Jesus. And he said unto his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead. And therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. For Herod had laid hold on John, that is, John the Baptist, and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. For John said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. And when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude, because they counted him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask. And she, being before instructed of her mother, said, Give me here John Baptist's head in a charger. And the king was sorry, nevertheless, for the oath's sake, and them that sat with him at meat, he commanded it be given her. And he sent and beheaded John in prison. And his head was brought in a charger, and given to the damsel, and she brought it to her mother. And the disciples came, and took up the body, and buried it, and went and told Jesus. When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. Now, I'm going to read a little more, but let me stop and comment on that. Um, Just to clarify things, in the beginning here, it said that this man, Herod, is the Tetrarch. Uh, Let me explain what that means. Tetrarch is a a Greek word, and it literally means uh, the ruler of a fourth. Uh, In other words, uh, if a kingdom were divided into four parts, he's the ruler of a fourth. Uh, But in practice, in the Roman Empire, they used that term tetrarch for anyone who was just a ruler of a small division of a larger uh, place. For instance, Palestine in this case. Um, And so they just used that as a terminology for someone who was a ruler of a province. Now this Herod, uh, this is not the same Herod that we read about in the beginning of the Gospels uh, that had the children of Bethlehem put to death when he heard from the wise men that the king of Israel had been born. If you remember that story, sometimes we read that at Christmas time. Uh, that was the father of this Herod. Now that first Herod, uh, called Herod the Great, the one who put to death the children when Jesus was born, if you remember that story uh, in Bethlehem, uh, his name was, uh, he was called Herod the Great, and that, that was his title. And he was the governor of all of Palestine, and he received that that prize, you might say, that favor or that position, because after the death of Julius Caesar, there was a civil war in Rome, and uh, the appointed heir of Caesar, Octavian, fought with Mark Antony over who would take his place. And Herod wisely sided with Octavian who was victorious. You know, Mark Antony went and made an alliance with Cleopatra, and they had all the ships of Egypt, but uh, Octavian uh, defeated him. And uh, so he became uh, Augustus. That was the title he took, Um, Octavian did. And so when you read in the beginning of the Gospels about the birth of Jesus and Augustus Caesar, that's who that was. And Herod the Great sided with Octavian, so as a reward, Octavian, when he became Caesar, when he became Augustus, the ruler of the Roman Empire, he gave him the governorship over all of Palestine. Now, this man, Augustus, had four wives and a lot of children. Uh, I think by some accounts, either 12 or 14 children by all these different wives that he had. And when he came to the end of his life, he, was, uh, he became ill and, and knew that he was dying. He wrote a will, and in his will he specified that his older children should divide his kingdom up under the, you know, subject to the approval of Augustus. And so, um, let's see, I made a little uh, record here, just, just so we know here, I want to be sure to get everybody's name right, of his older sons. Uh, he died in 4 B.C. Uh, and so, of, you remember in the Gospels it tells us that uh, uh, when, when he's, 
sent the soldiers to kill all the children in Bethlehem. An angel uh, appeared to Joseph and Mary in a dream and said, go to Egypt and, and get out of town, you know, get out of Dodge for a while. And then while they were in Egypt and all that killing was going on, then the angel came back a while later and said, the one who sought the child's life is dead. That was Herod the Great. And so that was about 4 BC when he died. And so his older children, uh, the oldest one was Archelaus, and he was appointed to be king of Judea, Samaria, and uh, Philip was next. Philip received the Northeast Territories and the title of Tetrarch. And then Herod Antipas, the Herod in our story today, became governor of Galilee. Now that's where Jesus was hanging out, and that's the Herod that we're talking about here, who uh, also had the title of uh, Tetrarch. So this is a man named Herod Antipas. Now, um, Philip, his older brother, had a wife named Herodias. And this Herod Antipas met her when he traveled to Rome in 26 AD. He made a little trip to Rome to visit his brother, and he met for the first time this woman, Herodias. And, you know, the historical accounts, and this is, you know, outside of the Bible, these are historical records about these people. Uh, it's not really clear exactly what happened, but evidently he fell in love with the wife of his brother, uh, this Herodias. And so she divorced Philip, and he divorced his wife. Uh, he was married at the time, this Herod Antipas that we're reading about here. Uh, let's see, his wife uh, was named, um, uh, I got her name here somewhere. Um, I know I wrote it down, so I, I want to be sure and tell you because I went to the trouble to write it down. Um, <laughs> Let's see, uh, at that time, Philip, his brother, was in his early 50s. Antipas was 46. Herodias was in her early 40s. Oh, yeah, uh, and Antipas divorced his wife, uh, Phesalus, spelled with a P-H, and uh, Herodias divorced Philip, and she and Antipas were then married. So then they went back to uh, Galilee so they could be the rulers there. Well, as we read in this story, John the Baptist uh, evidently said, uh, it's not lawful for you to have her. Now, we read in other Gospels that sometimes Herod liked to listen to the preaching of John the Baptist. And so I'm reading between the lines, and I'm assuming that John the Baptist, when Herod came to hear him preach, uh, became very pointed and said, you know what, Herod, it's not lawful for you to have her. That's Philip's wife. And it made uh, Herodias angry, of course. And so they had John arrested and thrown into prison, and we just read about what happened. Um, now, I'm going to shock you here today. Of course, that's what I'm here for, uh, to, be, to say shocking things. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to say to you that John the Baptist was wrong to point this out, to say this. It was none of his business, really. Uh, and the reason I say that is uh, you notice that Jesus, well, hey, we haven't read the whole thing, but I'll tell you that Jesus never said anything about it. John the Baptist, uh, nothing good came of it. Uh, it didn't help Herod, didn't help Herodias, didn't help anybody else. All it did was get John arrested and thrown into prison and beheaded, and it did no good to anybody. Um, it, was, it, it had no value for anyone for him to have said this. He is behaving like an Old Testament prophet. Now, in the Old Testament, prophets did exactly that thing. In fact, if you remember the story of David, David did something very much like what Herod did. David uh, took Bathsheba for a wife, and at least Herod didn't kill the, the other husband. David had Uriah uh, put to death uh, secondhand by putting him in the front of the battle so he could take Bathsheba for his wife. And if you remember the story, we're not going to turn and read there, I'll just refer to it. Uh, the prophet Nathan came to David and confronted him about what he had done. And then David repented and, uh, you know, it, it, and straightened himself out. But David did something pretty, pretty bad here, and the prophet confronted him. And prophets did that in the Old Testament. But here's the thing. Jesus didn't do this. Jesus didn't act like that. Jesus, uh, let me say that he had higher purposes in mind. Now, before we go on reading, let me just remind you of something Jesus said about John the Baptist. Uh, one thing, and again, we're not going to turn and read all these. I'm just going to quote them for you. Just take my word for it. Uh, Jesus, in Luke's gospel, said, The law and the prophets were until John, meaning John the Baptist. 
He said, the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, he said, the kingdom of God is preached and everyone is pressing into it. Making a distinction between what Jesus brought, which was the preaching of the kingdom of God, and how the Old Testament prophets, of which John was the last one, he said the law and the prophets were until John. But since then, the kingdom of God is preached. Uh, Jesus didn't act like an Old Testament prophet. You know, on another occasion, this is also in Luke's Gospel. Uh, this is in chapter 9. Again, we're going to turn read it. Just to save time, I'll quote it to you. Uh, the disciples were passing through Samaria. Now, that was one of the provinces of Palestine. You know, and Samaria had this long history of conflict with, with the Jews in Jerusalem, going clear back to the children of Solomon. And so they were passing through Samaria, and when the Samaritans heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, they got unhappy and wouldn't receive them. That means they, wouldn't, they didn't show them any hospitality. And so the disciples of Jesus, in turn, got unhappy and said, Jesus, do you want us to call down fire from heaven, just like Elijah did? Referring to an Old Testament prophet named Elijah, who did exactly that against the soldiers of the king of Samaria who sent these soldiers to arrest Elijah, and he called down fire from heaven. And fire came down from heaven and burned them all up. That's how Old Testament prophets behaved. And the disciples, using the Old Testament, the scriptural precedent, they said, Jesus, these Samaritans, they haven't changed at all. They're just like they were back there in the, in the scripture. And why don't we just call down fire from heaven? Judgment. Burn them up. That is what happened. It came down from heaven. It wasn't the devil. It was God. It was fire from heaven and burned them up. Why don't we just do that? You know what Jesus said to them? He said, you don't know what spirit you're of. He said, I haven't come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. He had a different agenda. Uh, he had a different purpose in mind. On another occasion, Jesus said, to his disciples, who do men say that I am? And they say, well, some say you're this prophet, some say you're that prophet, some say uh, you're you know, this one and that one, some say you're, uh, you know, Herod here said he's a John the Baptist come back from the dead. And Jesus said, uh, oh, uh, yeah, at the, at the time they said, why do, they, why do the people, why do the prophets say that before, you know, before the Son of Man comes, you, in other words, uh, that Elijah will come and restore all things. And he says, well, if you can understand it, Elijah's already come in the person of John the Baptist. And he said, John the Baptist is the greatest of all the Old Testament prophets. Jesus said that about him. He said, but listen to this now. He said, nevertheless, he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now, to me, that says that what Jesus came to inaugurate or to initiate or to bring was not the same. It was different. It was something, can I say, higher. It was a higher plane of things. It was a higher, more perfect expression of the will of God and the nature of God. Just like he told the disciples, I haven't come to destroy men's lives. I'm not going to send down fire from heaven. Jesus didn't say anything about Herod here and Herodias. Granted, it wasn't a good thing what Herod did, it, and it certainly wasn't a good thing how they responded and cut off John the Baptist's head. Jesus didn't say, he didn't remark on it at all. He just let it go. You know why? He had more important things, higher things. He was walking on a higher plane. He was thinking about more important things than these, you know, than what the political rulers were doing, than what was happening, this little soap opera that was playing out with, with Herod and, uh, and Philip's wife. This was all just a distraction. This is not really important. It, you know, it wasn't going to help anybody. Jesus was all about what he told the disciples. I haven't come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Now, let's read about what Jesus did immediately after all of this happened. This is in Matthew chapter 14, verse 13. Now, Torin is where I'm starting. When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude. And listen to this. He saw these people and he was moved with compassion toward them. And he healed their sick. Now, what's on Jesus' mind 
again, there's not the soap opera with Herod and Herodias and who should have whose wife and what, you know, what should be done about it, like John the Baptist uh, got all upset about. And, and, you know, and, and by the way, I hope it doesn't offend you if I say John the Baptist was wrong. He was wrong in, uh, in other ways as well. You know, when he was arrested, one of the Gospels tells us that when he was in prison, he sent messengers to Jesus and he said, uh, are you the one we're looking for or should we wait for somebody else? That's what John said. That, that, was, that was a, you know, a false step on his part as well. He began to doubt because Jesus was not doing what he thought he should do, evidently. He wasn't acting like an Old Testament prophet. Uh, and here Jesus, we see, just ignored all of this that went on with John and, and Her Herod and Herodias. The whole controversy, the whole, you know, all this hostility. Uh, I'm sure the disciples of John were not happy about it. And, but Jesus had something higher in mind. He was walking on a higher plane. He had more important things on his mind. He saw the people and he was moved with compassion toward them and healed their sick. Verse 15 says, when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a desert place and the time is now past. Send the multitude away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. That means food. Verse 16 says, Jesus said to them, they need not depart. Give you them, give ye them to eat. And they said unto him, we have here but five loaves and two fishes. And he said, bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude, in verse 19, to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and the two fishes. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and brake and gave the loaves to his disciples and his disciples to the multitude. And they all did eat and were filled. And they took up the fragments that remained, twelve baskets full. And they that had eaten were about five thousand men besides women and children. Now I heard one commentator say, well, they just had bigger loaves in those days. Well, they didn't have that big of loaves. I mean, I mean, <laughs> they didn't have that big of loaves. Uh, this was a blessing. This was a, a miraculous uh, intervention by God. Uh, and why? To, to meet the needs of those people. That was the only reason. It wasn't to impress them. It wasn't to win them over. It was just to, because he had compassion on them. That's why. Uh, that was his intent. That was what was on his mind. You know, here he's got 5,000 people here. You know, if he'd been thinking like John the Baptist, he could have said, okay, I got 5,000 here. Now, here's what we're going to do tomorrow. We're going to march up to Herod's palace and we're going to surround it. <laughs> 5,000 of us, we ought to be able to overcome his soldiers. He didn't do that. He had no intention of doing that. That was never, he would never consent to something like that. You know, when he was arrested, when they arrested him, he said, why are you coming at me with swords and staves, said, like I'm some kind of a criminal? The King James says, like you would encounter a thief. He said, I was daily sitting in the temple teaching, uh, meaning unarmed. He was just sitting there teaching. He said, why do you come at me with all these weapons like you would against a thief? It's interesting, the King James translation says a thief. Uh, the Greek word that's translated thief in that passage when they arrested Jesus does not mean uh, like a thief like we think of it, like somebody that breaks into a house and steals your property. It, meant, it was the Roman word, the word that the Romans used for uh, a rebel or an insurrectionist. He said, that's not what I'm about. You don't need weapons, you know. That, this was the furthest thing from his mind. Um, he wasn't concerned with these temporal uh, situations like Herod and Herodias and these things that John, got John the Baptist in trouble. He had a different, he brought something higher, something different, something more important. And here we've seen it, he healed their sick, he had compassion on them, he fed them. And now this is where it's interesting now. Uh, I mean, that was all interesting too, but this is more pertinent, I think, to us. Verse 22, it said, and straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him to the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship 
Remember, the ship's got the disciples in. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. Got the picture? Jesus went up in the, in the little hill to pray there, and he sent the disciples in his boat, and they're sailing across this, this body of water, and a, a storm came up. And they were, uh, in, they were in the ship and tossed around by the waves. It says the wind was contrary. We know how that is, <laughs> you know, about living here. Uh, I came home last night late. We had to go to Tulsa, and, you know, we got two kids in college, and one of them's graduating. That's Alex. And I had to load up all of his stuff, and Elizabeth's coming home for the summer. I had to load up all of her. So I had a whole truckload of stuff, and I got home about 9 o'clock, and all of my trash cans were all out in my path in the alley because <laughs> the wind was contrary. <laughs> so I didn't want to do it. I had to get out and pick up all the trash and the trash cans before I could even park the truck. But so you can understand, see, living in Oklahoma, we know what it means when it says the wind was contrary. Uh, we have that experience here uh, all the time. But listen to this. That's where the disciples were in this ship. And you can imagine being out on water with the wind you know, violent wind like, like we've experienced. It says, On the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. Walking on the sea. Now that's not normal, is it? Uh, they were in the, wa in the sea, in the boat, getting tossed around. But Jesus, they see him walking on top of the very thing that's, that's causing them so much consternation. He's on top of it. Walking on the sea. It... it, it on a, a higher level of uh, experience than, than human experience. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled. Well, yeah, I, right, I understand. They were, I mean, they're already troubled because of the, the situation they're in. Now they see him walking on the sea, and they said, it is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. You know, what they probably thought was something happened to him, and he got killed, now it's his ghost. I, th I think that's what they thought. A spirit means a ghost. Uh, and they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. That's the very first thing he addressed, just don't be afraid. Well, first thing he says, be of good cheer. Uh, you know, they might have been tempted to say, well, it's easy for you to say, walking on the sea like you are, but we're down here with this water splashing us, and it's about to sink our ship, and the wind hitting us in the face, and... And he says, be of good cheer, uh, it is I, be not afraid. Well, the reason he said that to them was he had compassion on them, just like with those multitudes. He was trying to say things to them that would give to them the same kind of uh, peace that he himself was experiencing. You see, he wasn't upset about the storm. He wasn't upset about what was happening. Just like he wasn't upset about Herod or Herodias, or John the Baptist. And even though this unfortunate thing happened to John the Baptist, it didn't seem to have taken away Jesus' peace. It didn't make him angry. It didn't make him afraid. It didn't make him distraught in any way. And this storm here, likewise, he's not distraught. He's not upset. He's not frustrated. He's not angry. And he says to them, you disciples who are sitting in that boat and crying out with fear, and not just because they thought he was a spirit, but they're in the midst of this storm. It says, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And every time I read this, something occurs to me. That is, this is the nature of Jesus. This is the nature of, of what his personality was like and what he was all about. And every time I read this, I have this thought. That is, if Jesus came walking in this building today, and I've said this lots of different times in different situations. If Jesus came walking in here today, he could if he wanted to. You know, he could open up that back door back there and come walking right in here. And if he did, we would all be shocked just like they were. What would you think if Jesus came walking in here? Well, I'd be surprised, wouldn't you? I'd be shocked, wouldn't you? I mean, my mouth would be hanging open. And you know what he would do, though? He would walk up to each one of us because he knows us all by name and he knows all about our lives and what things we're experiencing. And though we're not in a literal ship in a literal storm like they were, we've got our own problems and our own difficulties and things that cause us distress. 
And he would come to each one of us knowing all the things that we're going through and that cause us distress and anxiety. And he would say exactly this. He would say, be of good cheer. It is I, be not afraid. In other words, you've got nothing to be afraid of. I'm, it's me, I'm here, I haven't gone away. Uh, cheer up, you see, that we can take that to heart. And again, you know, every time I've ever said that, that I just said, he never has taken me up on it, opened the door and come in. So I have to say uh, on his behalf, since he's, you know, not walking in. Although something funny happened a few weeks ago, as many of you know, on Sunday nights, I go out to BJCC and have a service out there for the prisoners. Uh, or they call them uh, trainees. <laughs> That's what they call them. They keep changing the name of what they call them. They don't call them inmates or but that's okay, yeah, I mean, whatever. They, but anyway, so I, I said, that I, told, I read this story out there a few weeks ago, and, and I said that exact same thing. I said, you know what, uh, Jesus, if he wanted to, he could open up that door right there and come walking right in here. And just at that moment, the door came open, and everyone, they all, and it was, a, it was an officer coming in to check on him. <laughs> and he looked around like, why are you all staring at me? <laughs> anyway, that was kind of funny. But uh, you see, he would say that to us. This is his message. This is not just for these disciples sitting in that ship on that one day. This is what he would say. You see, metaphorically speaking, though they were in a ship in a storm, uh, we are in uh, similar kinds of distracting circumstances. But here, and he would say the same thing to us. And he said this because he had compassion on them. That's what his nature is. And just like, listen to this now. Just like he didn't find fault with Herod, he didn't complain, he didn't say anything about Herod's life, and you shouldn't have that woman, and so forth. Jesus didn't say anything about it. Neither would he say anything to you about anything. You know, he wouldn't try to, you know, lay anything, you know, heavy on you either. That's not what he's about. Jesus came to take away the sin of the world. So he's certainly not going to bring it up. Uh, so, here's something else interesting. We're, we got the story so far, but Peter, verse 28. Peter, you know, Peter is always kind of jumping up and saying things, uh, commenting on things. Sometimes good, sometimes he gets rebuked for it. Uh, verse 28 says, Peter answered and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. Now, you know what Peter is saying here, and I think this is important. You know what really what he's getting at is, he's saying, it's not enough for me, Peter, uh, it's not enough for me to just sit here in this boat and see you, Jesus, walking on the water and living this higher life, this higher kind of existence, this higher kind of experience. It's not just enough for me to sit here and see you I want it to be real for me, too. I want to experience what you're experiencing. That's what he's saying. He says, I want to experience this life that you're experiencing. And so he said, if it be thou, uh, bid me come unto thee on the water. Well, you know, having said that, what's Jesus going to say? No, it's not me. Don't come. <laughs> it is him. So verse 29 says, and he said, come. So Peter said, see, Peter said, if it's really you, uh, Bid me come. And so he says, all right, come. Now the ball is back in Peter's court. Now he's got to, you know what he's got to do? He's still sitting there in the boat. He's thinking, well, it, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Because <laughs> now you know what he's got to do? He's got to stand up in that boat that's being tossed around by the wind and the water's all splashing. He's got to go up and stand on the edge of that boat and step off into that water. Because Jesus said, come. But you know what? He did. He said, come, verse 29. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Now, this is remarkable. He saw a kind of life, a kind of experience in Jesus that he wanted to experience as well. And so, on the strength of Jesus' invitation, and while he had that on his mind, for this brief period of time, he walked and experienced just exactly what Jesus experienced. But look what happened in verse 30. 
But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. Now stop right there. He saw the wind. Of course, you don't see the wind. What it means is he saw the, the effects of the wind. He perceived, he got his attention off of Jesus and started thinking about the wind. And I guarantee you, this is the thought that ran through his mind. What do I think I'm doing? What am I doing out here? You know, he, see, it, it doesn't really make much sense in one way because do you mean if there's no wind, if there's no storm, you could just walk on the water? No, wind had nothing to do with it really, you see. But he got distracted. Now, I'm going to make a little connection here. Just like John the Baptist got distracted by what Herod was doing that had nothing to do with him, that he, it was none of his business, and he got in trouble because he acted the way that he did. It was none of his business. He got distracted. Jesus is not distracted. Jesus knows what he's about. Jesus knows what's really important. He's got his mind and his attention on the things that really matter not these distracting things. Now, Peter got distracted here. For a moment, he was walking just like Jesus when that was all that was in his mind was Christ. He was looking at him, seeing him, perceiving how he, how he was, what he was, what he was doing, and he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. Now, remember what Jesus said when they first saw him, be not afraid. But now he's, he forgot about that. He forgot what Jesus had said earlier. He forgot about Jesus altogether, and he was now thinking about the wind and the waves, and said he was afraid, and he began to sink. Now, that's also remarkable. Beginning to sink. Now, I don't know what your experience at the swimming pool is, but when I step off the edge and into the swimming pool, I've never had the experience of beginning to sink. <laughs> you just sink. <laughs> There's no beginning to it. You know what? The, I, I imagine this was a remarkable thing to see. Just gradually Peter sinking down into the water as his faith was draining out, as his attention was drawn to the wind and the waves and the things that really were irrelevant. The wind and the waves were irrelevant to the way Jesus was living, to G, the life that, he, that, Jesus, that Peter was perceiving in Jesus. The wind and the waves were a distraction. They had nothing to do with it. So he began beginning to sink. He, he, came, he became afraid, beginning to sink. He cried and said, Lord, save me. Well, even though Peter failed here, this was remarkable what he did. And even though he fell short, uh, he called on Jesus. And Jesus, it says in verse 31, immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? In other words, what's the problem? You know, you were doing fine. That's kind of what he's saying. Well, as we, as we see from reading, it, was, it had to do with what he was looking at, where his attention was, what, he was, uh, what his mind was set on. And here's the analogy for us uh, in our lives. We face all kinds of difficulties, and we're all different. Each one of us is on a different path. We have different problems. We have different frustrations. We have different things that could cause us to have anxiety or to be afraid or to, uh, you know, or to, you know, as we say, lose your cool, you know, or, or be upset about. We should focus our attention, though, not on those things, but on the Jesus that said, uh, be of good cheer. Uh, it's me. Be not afraid. That's not just a promise for those 12 disciples in that boat. Uh, that's what he would say to you and me as well. And the point I want to make here is if we can keep our attention focused on that and the fact that Jesus is bigger than anything that we face, no matter what it is, he can deal with whatever things we have to deal with. Uh, we just need to have the same kind of courage that Peter had and keep our attention focused on him and not be distracted by the, the wind and the waves, so to speak, the things that are going on around us. Okay, I think that's all I got today. Let's all stand up.